A 1-2. Well hit into left field. Did he get it up? Welcome to St. Louis, Albert Cole. Albert hits one a ton. Deep left. It is gone. 695. Oh my God. That ball is absolutely murdered. La Machina. MV3. Prince Albert. Few hitters in the history of baseball have ever inspired fear like him. A generational talent whose prowess at the plate made him a threat from the moment he arrived in the big leagues and fueled one of the most indelible careers and jaw-dropping peaks the game has ever seen. This is the story behind Albert Pujols. Jose Alberto Pujols Alcantara was born January 16, 1980 in Santo Domingo, the capital of the baseball-mad Dominican Republic. And, like a typical Dominican boy, he grew up immersed in the game. His father, Bienvenido Pujols, was a decorated softball pitcher in the DR, and a young Albert also dreamed of a future in baseball. His resources, however, were scarce. Pujols grew up playing catch with limes, using a glove fashion from a milk carton. Meanwhile, as much as Pujols idolized his father, Bienvenido's drinking forced the youngster to grow up quickly. Often, Pujols would have to carry his intoxicated father home after softball games. Still, those challenges notwithstanding, Pujols demonstrated prodigious talents at a young age, specifically a remarkable knack for hitting. As he later put it, I was always great at this game. At the age of 16, Pujols' big league potential became clear stateside when he moved with his father and grandmother to Independence, Missouri by way of New York City. Despite the crushing loneliness he felt upon settling in Independence, where his non-existent English language skills only further alienated him, Pujols looked plenty comfortable on the baseball diamond at Fort Osage High School and instantly became the most dangerous hitter in their lineup. Soon enough, Pujols' otherworldly hitting skills turned him into an almost mythological figure in the area, where he shattered high school and summer league records and effectively dared opposing teams to pitch to him. Many did not. In his second year with Fort Osage, Pujols was walked a whopping 55 times in 88 trips to the plate. Incidentally, in those 33 precious at-bats, Pujols smacked eight homers while hitting 660, outrageous numbers that, combined with his already filled out frame and burgeoning goatee, led some opponents to believe that Pujols was older than he claimed. In any event, Pujols was a tantalizing prospect despite his persistent struggles at shortstop for Fort Osage, and in January of 1999, Pujols enrolled at Maplewoods Community College, hoping to inflate his MLB draft stock. Seemingly, the plan worked to a T. In his first junior college game, Pujols walloped a grand slam off future all-star Mark Burley and turned an unassisted triple play at shortstop. By mid-season, his coach had anointed him the best hitter he'd ever seen, and Pujols finished his first JUCO campaign with a 466 batting average and 22 home runs in 56 games. Meanwhile, Pujols also met his future wife that year, falling in love with Deidre and her daughter Isabella, who sparked Pujols' extensive charity work with those affected by Down syndrome. Needless to say, it was a transformative season for Pujols, and both his coach and the increasingly awestruck local baseball community figured that Pujols would easily go in the early rounds of the 1999 MLB Draft. Yet, only one big league club, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, invited Pujols to a pre-draft workout, and questions ultimately persisted about his age, his body, and his defensive home. And so, as the early rounds melted away, Pujols remained on the board. Every team in the majors passed on him repeatedly, including the Devil Rays, who selected future AL MVP Josh Hamilton with the first overall pick, nabbed eventual franchise legend Carl Crawford with their second round selection, and then ultimately took another 48 nobodies. It wasn't until the 13th round that the St. Louis Cardinals decided to take a shot on Pujols, who received a signing bonus of just $30,000 with another 30 grand promise to cover his college tuition if baseball didn't work out. Spoiler alert, it worked out. In his first pro season, Pujols ripped through the minor leagues at an absurd pace, 
with his mighty bat propelling him from low A all the way to triple A by season's end. Before he had even made his big league debut, it was obvious that Pujols was a special talent and that the rest of the league had goofed in letting him fall to the 13th round. For their part, the Cardinals suspected they had a difference maker on their hands, but the club, fresh off a trip to the National League Championship Series in 2000, wasn't necessarily ready to thrust the kid into the big league spotlight after just one minor league season. As impressive as he was as a non-roster invitee to big league spring training in 2001, Pools was still ticketed for AAA for some more seasoning against high-level arms. But then, fate intervened. With opening day looming, Bobby Bonilla, the Cardinals' would-be left fielder, was felled by a hamstring strain. They handed the job to the 21-year-old Phenom, who had torn the cover off the ball all spring. And while they didn't know it at the time, they had just launched one of the most remarkable careers in baseball history. Now, the guy who made the club out of spring trading, Albert Pujols, and I'll tell you what, his career is skyrocketing. As it happens, the 2001 campaign started off inauspiciously for both the Cardinals and Pujols. St. Louis opened their season by getting swept in Colorado, and while Pujols collected his first big league hit in the Cardinals' opening day loss, that ground ball single was his only hit for the series. Quickly though, things changed. Over the ensuing three-game set in Arizona, Pujols launched the first home run of his MLB career, collected seven hits in 14 at-bats, and drove in eight runs to propel St. Louis to a series sweep. And although Bonilla was ready to rejoin the team in the wake of that series, with the Cardinals' home opener looming, St. Louis couldn't in good conscience send down the rookie, hitting 348. Instead, Pujols hung on to his roster spot, got slotted into the Cardinals' starting lineup for their home opener, and immediately endeared himself to the Bush Stadium crowd. A 1-2. Well hit into left field. Did he get enough? At the wall. Welcome to St. Louis, Albert Pujols. 2-0, Cardinals. Before long, St. Louis adored Pujols. He quickly became the most fearsome hitter in a lineup loaded with stars, from Mark McGuire to Jim Edmonds to J.D. Drew. His eye was impeccable, his contact skills were unmatched, and he absolutely pulverized mistakes. Opposing pitchers were helpless. Albert Pujols goes deep again. By the time October rolled around, Pujols had put together one of the most impressive rookie seasons ever. He finished the year hitting 329 with 37 homers, 47 doubles, and a 10-13 OPS, setting a National League rookie record for extra base hits, and, not surprisingly, taking home the NL Rookie of the Year award in a unanimous vote. Pujols' sensational campaign also earned him his first Silver Slugger award and made him the first Cardinals rookie since 1955 to make it to the All-Star Game. For his efforts, he finished fourth in NL MVP voting. Ultimately, Pujols' rookie season beggared belief, and it seemed impossible that he'd be able to replicate those numbers moving forward now that the league had had an opportunity to study him. In reality, however, Pools' rookie season established the historic standard of excellence that the emergent superstar would meet year in and year out for the ensuing decade. Hitters are human. They slump. They struggle. They have down years. But Pujols was something else entirely. He was a machine. He was La Machina. Fly ball into straightaway center field and deep. Mike Cameron going back to the one he track, leaps up, and it is gone. A grand slam home run for Albert Pujols. As a sophomore, Pujols, now firmly ensconced in left field after bouncing around as a rookie, hit 314 with 34 homers and 40 doubles, finishing second in MVP voting behind Barry Bonds. Then, in 2003, Pujols somehow discovered another gear, leading the majors in batting average, runs scored, doubles, and total bases while smashing 43 homers. In 2004, after landing a seven-year contract extension worth $100 million and finally settling at first base, Pujols led the majors in total bases for a second straight year, hitting 331 with 46 bombs and carrying the Cardinals to their first pennant since 1987. Pujols, a five-hit, three-homer game. Still, the MVP award eluded him on account of Bonds' well-being Barry Bonds, but Pools' reign as the league's most decorated player, as baseball's most decorated player, was about to begin. 
With Bond sidelined for virtually all of 2005 due to injury, Pujols took home the NL MVP award with relative ease, leading his league in wins above replacement, according to Baseball Reference, while putting up his usual video game numbers. That October, Pujols also pushed St. Louis back into the NLCS, where the superstar hit an iconic homer off Brad Lidge that still has yet to land. 0-1 oh, to Pujols. In the air left field, and Pujols has given St. Louis the lead. A dramatic, towering three-run home run. And although he fell just shy of a second consecutive NL MVP award in 2006, finishing second to Ryan Howard despite smacking a career-high 49 homers, Pools landed the ultimate prize after multiple near misses for him and the Cardinals. While St. Louis regressed hard that year after two straight 100-win seasons and just narrowly squeaked into the playoffs, the Cardinals soared to unexpected heights that October, thanks in large part to Pools' unwavering excellence. First, Pujols muscled them past the San Diego Padres with a 5 for 15 showing in the National League Division Series. He then posted a 983 OPS in his club's seven-game NLCS showdown with the New York Mets to propel the Cardinals to their second NL pennant in three years. And although Pujols collected only three hits against the Detroit Tigers in the World Series, he was a menace nonetheless, crushing a two-run homer off Justin Verlander in Game 1 and posting a 429 on base percentage for the series to help the Cardinals secure a highly improbable championship, their first in almost a quarter century. And, seemingly, the final box on Pujols' proverbial to-do list had been checked. Before turning 27, Pujols was an MVP, an All-Star several times over, a batting champion with multiple Silver Slugger awards, a Gold Glover, and a World Series champion, not to mention being one of the most universally respected players, philanthropists, and gentlemen in the game. His place in Cooperstown was already earmarked. But his play in the years that followed ensured that he'd get in unanimously. Over the next four seasons, Pools continued to reach all his usual benchmarks like clockwork, averaging nearly eight war per season while taking home two more NL MVP awards in 2008 and 2009, respectively. And there's a strong case to be made that he deserved it over Joey Votto in 2010 as well. Moreover, the 2010 campaign also marked Pujols' 10th consecutive season with at least 30 homers, 100 RBIs, and a batting average of 300 or better. The only player in baseball history with more such seasons is Babe Ruth, and even his longest streak of consecutive such seasons topped out at 8. Ultimately, Pujols' first decade in the majors remains one of the great marvels in baseball history. All told, Pools hit 331 with a 1050 OPS, producing at a rate 72 percentage points above league average. During that time, he averaged 41 homers, 43 doubles, and 156 games played per year. He also accrued roughly 77 war, seven wins more than baseball's second most valuable player, Alex Rodriguez. Moreover, he was an all-star nine times and won a half dozen Silver Slugger awards to go along with his three MVPs. And heading into the final year of his contract, it seemed as though Pujols might never slow down, that he'd continue tormenting pitchers in perpetuity. Humans age, humans decline, but Pujols, again, was the machine. And he kept on humming in 2011, at the age of 31, bashing 37 homers to lead the Cardinals back to the playoffs before authoring an October for the ages. With his free agency looming, Pools hit 353 with an 1155 OPS throughout the Cardinals' epic postseason run, and further burnished his legendary status with a three-homer performance in Game 3 of the World Series against the Texas Rangers. Ultimately, St. Louis outlasted Texas in that epic seven-game showdown, best remembered for David Freeze's heroics, and the Cardinals hoisted the Commissioner's Trophy for the second time in six seasons. And with another impressive season and postseason under his belt, Pools was primed to command one of the biggest contracts in baseball history. At one point, it seemed like a foregone conclusion that the Cardinals would eventually be the team to give him that contract, but as free agency unfolded, the prospect of Pujols being a Cardinal for life grew decidedly less certain. Every major league team has been held hostage by these Pujols negotiations. How badly is this jamming everything up? Well, think of a rock being thrown into the middle of the pond and the ripples going out. Months earlier, Pujols had rejected a nine-year extension worth roughly $200 million from St. Louis, and the Cardinals seemed disinclined to increase their offer much in the wake of a season that hinted at decline. 
Although Pujols' numbers were still great in 2011, they weren't Pujols great. He failed to hit 300 for the first time in his career and posted career lows in on-base percentage and slugging percentage. Still, multiple rival teams were unfazed by Pujols' relative down year, and on the final day of the 2011 winter meetings, the three-time MVP signed a 10-year, $240 million contract with the Los Angeles Angels, then the third biggest deal in baseball history. Pujols' monumental contract, plus the additions of Josh Hamilton and CJ Wilson, was supposed to finally get the Angels over the hump after almost a decade of close but no cigar seasons. Instead, however, it quickly became clear that Pujols' best days were behind him, and that the Angels had paid nearly a quarter billion dollars for an outdated machine. In his first season with Anaheim, Pujols eked out 30 homers and 105 RBIs, but his productivity still waned for a second straight year. The 32-year-old established new career lows in batting average, OBP, and slugging percentage, while finishing outside the top 10 in MVP voting for the first time ever. Meanwhile, the supposedly revamped Angels finished third in their division, despite the outsized efforts of a 20-year-old rookie named Mike Trout. From there on, Pools' production truly cratered. In 2013, a bout of plantar fasciitis limited him to just 99 games. When he was on the field, he was a shell of his former self, hitting just 258 with diminished power. Soon enough, that became the new normal. Over the next three seasons, as he contended with recurring foot problems and the ravages of age, Pools didn't once muster an OPS of even 800, and though he managed to reach several major milestones during that stretch, notably hitting career home run number 500, those markers of all-time greatness only made his descent into mediocrity all the more painful to watch. By 2017, the halfway point of his mega deal, Pools had become a full-on liability too expensive and too venerated to cut loose, but also plainly undeserving of regular playing time. That year, Pools was the worst full-time player in all of baseball, costing his team nearly two full wins according to Fangraphs, while mustering an anemic 672 OPS. Still, the Angels, a perpetual also ran, continued to run him out there every day, and Pools rewarded them with a handful of memorable moments, like career home run number 600. This one's got a chance to go! Score! Big fly for Albert Pujols! Number 600! Eventually, he also racked up career hit number 3,000. There's a flare out to right field, and there it is! Hit number 3,000 for Albert Pujols! As the years passed, though, and Pujols continued to flounder, it seemed increasingly inevitable that the Angels would at some point have to cut him loose, both for their sake and for his. And about a month into the 2021 season, the final year of his ill-fated contract, they finally did. After watching Pujols stumble to a 198 batting average through the campaign's first four weeks, the Angels designated Pujols for assignment, cutting the living legend after four straight miserable seasons. In a sense, his unceremonious exit was the perfect capper to a wildly underwhelming stint in Anaheim. Across his almost decade-long run with the Angels, Pools made one All-Star game, didn't win a single Silver Slugger award, and accrued a total of 5.7 war. In his rookie season with the Cardinals, he was worth 7.2 war. And the Angels, moreover, made the playoffs only once in his time with the club. Still, Pools' illustrious career couldn't end like that. And sure enough, by virtue of being Albert Pools, and with the Angels on the hook for his remaining salary, the 41-year-old found himself generating some interest after being cut loose. Not long after getting released by the Angels, Pools found a new opportunity elsewhere in Los Angeles, signing on with the Dodgers. This, it seemed, was the epilogue Pools deserved. A reserve role with the National League's preeminent powerhouse? a chance to pad his resume a bit more and potentially get another ring without being overexposed? It was the perfect ending. Except, Pools wasn't finished. After smacking a dozen homers in 85 games with the Dodgers, who eventually came up short in the NLCS, Pools hinted that he wasn't ready to retire. At the age of 42, he wanted to keep playing. And as it turned out, one particular organization was more than happy to oblige him. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to St. Louis in a Cardinals uniform where he belongs, Albert Pujols. 
In late March, with the 2022 season around the corner, Pujols agreed to a one-year deal with the Cardinals, returning to the organization and city where he'd become an icon. After finalizing the deal, Pujols announced that the 2022 campaign, his 22nd in the big leagues, would be his last. And he sure did go out with a bang. Following an uneven first few months in his old stomping grounds, Pools was seemingly rejuvenated after being named an honorary All-Star at the 2022 Midsummer Classic. Down the stretch, Pools was one of the most dangerous hitters in all of baseball, evoking his former self in his improbable pursuit of career home run number 700. The 0-1 pitch. Albert hits one a ton! Deep left! And it's gone! 695! They pitch to him, and they get burned! His final at bat against the Cubs, a pinch hit, two-run homer. Believe it or not, the most productive 10-game stretch of Pujols' career by OPS came in August of 2022. Thanks to his torrid second half, Pujols put up his best numbers in years and was instrumental in the Cardinals' outstanding season. To say nothing of the joy he brought to Busch Stadium simply by being there every day in his iconic number 5 jersey. That profound love and admiration for Pujols, however, extends beyond St. Louis and the Midwest. It stretches throughout the United States, across the Dominican Republic, and genuinely around the world. Throughout the history of the game, few players have ever been more accomplished or more respected than Albert Pujols, whose peak was unrivaled, whose resilience was unwavering, and whose all-time greatness is unquestionable. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button.